We will move on to the next item, our 6.2 item, our 906 AM item, consideration of update for COVID-19. And I believe we have Director Portney here. Good morning. Good morning. And we also have Dr. Charlie Evans here, Madam Chair, Okay. for the report. So whoever is going to start, we'll give you the floor. So, uh, thank you to the entire board for inviting me back to speak to you. Um, I wanted to first start out with the presentation, uh, the EPI uh, update report, and I'm not sure is... Is Sarah on to speak to that? Sarah is, was not able to attend, but her um, slides are showing now. Okay, so let's go to the first slide. So this is showing uh, COVID uh, positivity throughout the state of California. The top line is the state of California, the blue line. The bottom line is the Rural Association of Northern California Health Officers, which is most of the rural counties in Northern California. So you can see that the state of California looks like it has reached a plateau in the number of infections. The, the line for the rural counties, however, is still creeping up. We have not quite plateaued. And, you know, I think we expect that to happen in the next week or two but the rural counties are a little bit behind the, the state in that regard, next slide. So this is um, tracking COVID throughout California. And, and again, you see the number of cases there declining for California. The cases for uh, Lake County are down on the bottom. Actually, it's it's the Rancho counties in the uh, red still going up. Go ahead, next slide. And hospitalizations are still uh, on the rise. This is for hospitalizations in California. Uh, and you can see uh, if you look at where we were back in September, which was the peak of Delta, we're well above that now. Uh, we haven't quite reached the peak where we were back a year ago. Um, <clears throat> but the number of hospitalizations is still continuing uh, to rise. Um, within our county, uh, within the Northern California counties, our cases are up this week by about 15 over last week. Um, and although they're, they're rising, they haven't done the the rapid rise that we've seen in other counties to the south of us. So this is our test positivity in Lake County. And um, you can see that we're at 27.5% test positive. That's very, very high. It's the highest we've been by quite a long shot. Back in September, we were around 17, 18. Um, with the Delta and we're, we're well above that. So very, very high. Uh, transmission rate going on in the county right now. It's a 6.1% increase over last week. Next slide. And this is our case rate within the county. Again, uh, very high, 89.4 cases per 100,000. That's the highest we've been. And next slide. And this is just numbers of cases. You can see how the numbers are, are quite, quite high. Um, we're almost twice what we were uh, back uh, with the pandemic in, uh, a year ago. Next. And this is cases by age group. If you look at the far right column, I think that gives you the most information. Um, the age groups that are, have the highest uh, case rate are those that are working. Um, so 35 to 49 year olds are 97.7 per 100,000, whereas the 65 plus year olds are only 31 per 100,000. 31 is still high, um, but the highest numbers are, are in the working population. And then, uh, of course, the kids in schools are, are up there. Next. And this is just a, a graph showing the same thing. So uh, the top group is the 18 to 49 year olds. That they have the highest rate of climb. Um, next, 
highest rate of crime is the uh, 5 to 17 year olds, and then the 50 to 64 year olds, and then the 0 to 4 year olds, and the lowest is the over 65 group. Next. So by ethnicity, um, the uh, Latino population is, has the highest uh, rate there at 72. And um, next is the um, American Indian and Alaskan natives. And uh, below that are the Caucasian. Next. So hospitalizations and ICU capacity. Fortunately, we still have uh, capacity to take on more patients. Um, when this was prepared on the 24th, there were eight COVID patients hospitalized on the wards and three in the ICUs. We were out of ICU bed availability. I heard yesterday they do have ICU beds uh, and they do have ward beds, but um, we are we are in that steep uh, rise, as you can see from the graph. Next. And this is just vaccine coverage by, by age. You can see we're not doing very well with our children. <clears throat> Five to 11 year olds, we only have 11% vaccinated. And those aren't fully vaccinated in the uh, 12 to 17 year age group. We have about 44%. And then you can see the other categories there. Um, we, we are doing much better on the 50 to 64 year olds and the 65 plus. I'm reaching 80% in the 50 to 64 year olds is a real accomplishment. That's great. Next, that might be the last slide. Yeah. So <clears throat> Omicron has had a huge uh, impact on hospitals throughout our state. Patients hospitalized with COVID-19 disease have skyrocketed uh, in the last several weeks, though so this is not yet fully materialized in Lake County. Our hospitalization numbers and our COVID hospitalized cases have increased in the past several weeks, but we have not seen the rapid rise seen in hospitals, say, in Sonoma and Mendocino County, and we still have capacity in the ICU and the wards. Our uh, infection curve is a little behind the state, and I expect that we will see a surge in hospitalizations and a rise in deaths in the coming two to four weeks. Fortunately, patients hospitalized with Omicron do not tend to have the severe respiratory failure as often as we saw with the mother virus and with the Delta virus. But nonetheless, some people do get extremely ill with Omicron. I was working last Saturday and I took care of a young man who was 20, 27 years old. He was not vaccinated. He had been sick for a week. He came in in full-blown respiratory failure, one lung collapsed, the other full of fluid, gasping for breath, he required chest tubes, intubation, and I think it's unlikely that he will survive. On the same day, I also saw a young uh, woman, 40 years old, was a mother of two who had COVID and had a, uh, signs and symptoms of an acute stroke. So although in the news they say that Omicron, you don't get that sick, uh, we still see severe illness with Omicron in the unvaccinated population. Hospitals throughout the state are having quite a problem with staffing as nurses and physicians go out with the COVID infection on a daily basis leaving uh, already overworked uh, staff to fill in for them when they are out. <clears throat> in order to cope with these shortages, uh, many institutions have asked EMTs and paramedics to help staff the ER and care for the large number of patients. Uh, patients who are ill but do not require hospitalization are encouraged to go to testing sites to get tested through, or through their physician's offices rather than using the hospitals and the ERs so that they don't over, overburden them. At the same time, those who are ill and are having difficulty breathing should proceed directly to the emergency department without delay, because there are things that we can do early on to help you uh, prevent some of the severe uh, complications of COVID-19. Schools have also been hit very hard. Uh, our vaccination rates for kids of school age are low, as I went over with uh, Sarah's slides. With the high infectivity rate of Omicron, many students have been out ill. At the same time, many of the staff at schools have become ill. There is uh, a tremendous amount of transmission going on in the community and in the schools. The schools have closed, that have closed have closed because they don't have adequate healthy staff to come to work. Lake County Public Health is committed to 
keeping schools open. They have assisted in outbreak management and encourage students to uh, arrange themselves in pods to mitigate some of the transmission risk. Vaccinating all school age children is the best tool we have to prevent further school closures. Effective masking with tight fitting N95 and KN95 masks will also curtail uh, virus transmission. Lake County Public Health requested masks from CDPH for schools, and they have been allotted the following 20,000 KN95s, 110,000 surgical masks, 12,000 gloves, 15,000 N95s, and 200 pairs of goggles. Those should be distributed as soon as they arrive. Los Angeles County most recently uh, changed the requirements on masking and require all children who are attending school to wear a surgical or an N95 mask. The cloth mask has been clearly shown uh, to be inferior and they are not considered adequate protection. Indoor sporting events is another area where super spreader viral transmission can occur. Effective masking with N95 is essential at these events. Those who are unvaccinated or who are immunosuppressed should consider avoiding such events. Nursing homes have also been hit hard with Omicron with numerous outbreaks in our, in our multiple homes. Fortunately, to date, we have not seen deaths and this is because of the high rate of vaccination within the homes. Most of the infections have been brought into the homes by infected caregivers unknowingly. Businesses have also been affected by Omicron variant on numerous levels, just as we see in the hospitals, employees and the businesses have had a much higher infection rate with Omicron. This has led to mandatory quarantine and isolation and time off work. The supply pool for workers was low before Omicron. And in addition to staffing problems, many businesses have been affected by supply chain issues. Supply chain issues have turned in turn have caused uh, significant scarcity in the markets. And as a result of the scarcity, we're seeing inflation on just about everything. If we broaden our perspective and look at Omicron internationally, one only needs to, to gaze at China to get an idea of how this can affect the supply chain. China has maintained its uh, uh, policy of trying to eliminate all COVID cases. Zero COVID cases is what they strive for. They have locked down cities as large as 13 million people for weeks at a time to try and control the spread of the virus. As the host of the Winter Olympics, they are likely to see an uptick in cases, despite the draconian measures they are instituting to prevent transmission. Currently, they have reported numerous cases in and around Peking. If they persist with the zero COVID strategy, this could have drastic further impact on our global supply chain. So what are our tools for battle for this virus? And we've talked about masking. Please discard your cloth mask and upgrade to N95 or KN95 masks. So they are tight fitting uh, and they cover all your respiratory passages. They really work uh, to prevent transmission. Vaccinations, if you're not vaccinated, please discuss it with its advantages with your private physician. Although we are seeing Omicron infections in those who are vaccinated and boosted, we are not seeing the critical illnesses we see in those who are unvaccinated. The vaccine can save your life. It is extremely safe and effective. We spoke about boosting and its impact against the Omicron variant. It is clear that boosting significantly increases your immunity, multiple fold. Eligibility remains five months after your Pfizer or Moderna vaccine or two months after your J&J &J vaccine. For those who are immunosuppressed, many specialists recommend a fourth shot please discuss what is safest for you with your personal physician. <clears throat> in Lake County, a vaccination ban has been dispatched by the state uh, to help with vaccines. Uh, this, I believe, will arrive tomorrow, and uh, the schedule for that will be posted on uh, the county website. And I encourage you all to take advantage of that. Testing. Um, PCRs remain the gold standard for testing and are available through private physician offices as well as testing centers. Antigen tests have been made available at no cost to households and can be ordered through the U.S. Uh, Postal Service. Antigen tests are available at some schools, though the supply chain there is strained. 
There has been some concern over the accuracy of the antigen tests. Some studies have shown that they can be incorrect 40% of the time. This requires more study. If you test negative on an antigen test, you should still take the normal precautions of effective masking, social distancing, and avoiding indoor events. Antigen testing is recommended before and after travel. It is recommended if you intend to visit someone who is immunosuppressed, and it can be most helpful in the school environment. Treatments, uh, monoclonal antibodies have been quite limited since the advent of Omicron. Uh, some of the preparations used prior are not effective against Omicron, and the ones that are effective are in short supply. Paxlovid is the only antiviral treatment uh, we have in Lake County for outpatient treatment of COVID-19. It is most helpful if taken promptly after infection. If you wait until you're very, very ill, it's not effective. North Lake Pharmacy is the only pharmacy in the county that stocks it currently and, and supplies are uh, not abundant. So where are we in this pandemic? Yogi Berra once said, it's not over till it's over. And although the state has reached its peak, uh, as we see in the media, most of the rural uh, counties in Northern California have not yet reached their peak. We are likely to see that rapid rise in hospitalizations in the coming weeks, and unfortunately, a small percentage of these people will not survive. Although the rise in cases has come quickly, the backside of the curve is likely to have a longer tail and not to drop off abruptly as we went up so abruptly. With such a high measured prevalence in our community, it is wise to curtail gatherings and minimize risk in the next two to three weeks. Some individuals have taken a fatalistic <clears throat> approach and decided they're going to get Omicron eventually, so they are engaging in some of the high-risk behaviors that encourage transmission. I strongly encourage you to stay the course in your battle against this virus. The long-term consequences of infection aren't yet known, and some of the studies suggest that as many as one in three or 33% infected will have some long-lasting effect even if you just have a mild infection. The tools of masking, vaccination, testing, social distancing, hand washing, and plain common sense can keep you safe and keep you healthy. So what's next? Uh, no one can predict what variant will follow Omicron. Undoubtedly, there will be more variants. Might the future variants be more like the common cold? Might they be conversely uh, resistant to the current vaccines demanding that we get a different vaccine to protect us from the deadly effects of the virus. We don't know. The best experts in the world are unable to opine on this one, though they do all agree that there will be more variants to follow Omicron. I personally am optimistic about where we're going. Um, I think that, that we can prevent serious infection and we have more options to treat infection as time goes on. And with this time, well, time will help us to avoid some of the shutdowns and on all levels of society in the future, inching us back toward normal, but it will be inch by inch. In the interim, we must be patient with one another and tolerant of the vast differences in our opinions. I know families that have become alienated over their differing views of SARS-CoV-2. As a practicing emergency physician, who sees the ravages of this virus day in and day out, I have a hard time understanding why we are not more vaccinated as a county, as a state, and as a nation. I, I treat vaccinated, unvaccinated patients every day, and I treat them with the utmost level of respect. I have not always received that level of respect in return. I expect I suspect that is because of a lack of trust. Trust is earned not by words, but by actions. And I hope all of us can make strides forward in respecting and trusting one another. This is best done with acts of kindness and open dialogue to understand each other with particular focus on those differences. Reaching out to a family member with a difference of opinion is a great place to start and it may save their life. So in the interim, as the brunt of the Omicron variant hits us, please use all the tools you possess to stay well. Masking, boosting, <laughs> testing, 
hand washing, and avoid indoor gatherings for the next two to three weeks. Use your common sense and live your life. So thank you, I'll be open to questions. Thank you, Dr. Evans. Any of the supervisors have any questions for the doctor? Yeah. Supervisor Paiska. Thank you, Dr. Evans. Um, I, I so appreciate your updates. Um, my question's for Director Portney about the van that we have coming from the state. And um, when, you know, how, I'm just wondering how you're anticipating scheduling that van. And um, clearly from the slides that Sarah prepared, we, we have a lot of ground to gain with our pediatrics and our teenagers, and I'm wondering how we're going to um, kind of improve that access. Great question, and good morning. Um, I just want to appreciate uh, Dr. Evans' um, update. Uh, that was pretty special, and thank you for delivering that information on a public platform for everyone to hear. So for the mobile van, uh, we are currently working with our health service department teams to uh, work with, uh, reach out to community-based organizations, school districts, and uh, other partners to find strategic places to host uh, pop-up uh, vaccination clinics. Uh, we are meeting regarding this matter uh, tomorrow, and we are working and communicating and reaching out to uh, our fire departments as well, who have graciously offered to support as needed. Um, and once we develop internally the strategic plan and identify the partners and partners who want to support, we will begin to roll that out and promote via Facebook and our other social media networks to ensure that the public and the board is informed so that we can collectively uh, promote this uh, at the uh, county level so that access is clear and uh, reliable. Thank you so much. And uh, we really look forward to, to that rolling out and to um, having the media campaign as well. And once again, like we're, we're looking for equity, we're looking for access and for anybody that wants this choice. Absolutely. Any other supervisors? Supervisor Sabatier. Thank you very much, and thank you for the update, Dr. Evans. Uh, I'm glad that uh, right now public health is having that conversation with our fire districts. I know they were pivotal for both the testing sites and the vaccine clinics uh, that started at the very beginning. Uh, very thankful for their efforts on that. I did want to get a little bit more information. Uh, you talked about how there's only North Lake Pharmacy that has access to, I think you said it's called Pax. Love it. I, I don't even remember the name if you can provide that, but how, how do you get access to that? Do you have to go in and see your doctor and get prescribed? Uh, what, what's, what's the steps? Because it sounded like it's available, but not necessarily we were uh, not provided the information on how to access the medication itself. Correct. Right. So the, the uh, antiviral requires a prescription from your uh, physician, and that, that prescription then be sent to the uh, North Lake Pharmacy. That's the only pharmacy that has applied for uh, for the antiviral in the county. So, to be a county that re to be a pharmacy that receives the antiviral, you need to apply for it, and none of the other pharmacies have applied. So, it's very important that physicians know, patients know, that's the pharmacy they need to go to to get it, and. I think um, Dr. Pace told me we were allotted 20 doses, which uh, is not very much when you look at the number of cases that we have. So those doses should really be directed at the people who are most likely to get sick. So that would be the unvaccinated because they are much more likely to get critically ill, but also the, the immunosuppressed who have been vaccinated and boosted. And so one, one of my questions to you because of the answer you provided is we don't have an urgent care necessarily. There are uh, open slots, for example, at some of our clinics, but urgent care is a difficult thing here in this county. And so I believe that there's a very small window of opportunity where the medication uh, can be taken before it's too far into uh, the symptoms and the severity of the illness that it actually makes a change. Uh, what are the hospitals doing? Do you have to go to the ER? Uh, like what, what is the best way to do this when there's limited access to urgent care for people to just pop in and get an appointment and get those prescriptions? 
Great question. So the order in which you should try to get seen is one through your primary care physician. I mean, some physicians will actually prescribe it for you if you call them over the phone and tell them you have a positive test and you, they know you and you have risk factors, they'll prescribe it for you. Two, if you can't get into your primary care physician is to use urgent care. And three, we proceed to the ER. Okay, thank you. Any other supervisors have questions or comments before I open it up to the public? So I'm gonna go ahead and open it up to the public. I'm gonna start in the boardroom. Does anybody have a question? He didn't raise it. Oh yeah, no, I just wanted to thank Dr. Evans and, and uh, Director Portney for, for the report, um, especially in regards to the Omicron uh, situation. You know, that's one of the things I put, uh, I wanted to see if we can discuss that. Um, I really appreciate the uh, highlighting the ICU beds. That is a really, it's a real situation. Um, I understand there's concern about it from the public. However, empirically, it is real. Um, my mother is in the ICU right now and could not get in to the ICU because all ICU beds in the northern region were full. And that she went in two days ago. She barely got in last night and now she's on an intubator. So we can look at studies from here and there, doctors here and there, but empirically, I went to the hospital outside her window to, because I can't visit her inside, and this is real. So I'm just letting people know. I, I, we can look at the studies, but let's look at empirical knowledge, things that are really happening, and it is affecting our county and our people. The elder that I asked for a moment of silence, um, my Aunt Covita, she didn't have COVID, but she couldn't get into an ICU bed because they're full because of people that have COVID. Now let's think if there was an ICU bed available, would she still be here with us? Yes, possibly. But it's just time to really look at the reality. You know, if I went to Iraq and said, these are blanks, I could just walk around and I might be in heaven one day, you know, or that day. But no, I knew and took the chance that it wasn't blanks. I mean, let's just be real about these things. Sorry for that. I'm getting a little emotional, but I just have to say it. I think you're, I'm so sorry to hear about your mom and I, I wish her the best. But, you know, what you're saying is absolutely true. This is something that as an emergency department physician, we struggle every single day with trying to get people into ICU beds. You know, we look as far south as Gilroy as far uh, west as Modesto to try to get people hospitalized. I mean, it's, it's a struggle every single time we work. And, and, you know, the only way we're going to get through this is working together and doing those things that prevent infection, not trying to treat the infection after it occurs. Thank you. So I'm going to go ahead and back into the boardroom. Is there anybody in the boardroom wishing to ask a question or make a comment? Not seeing any, so we'll go ahead and go to the Zoom room. <clears throat> We're going to go ahead and start with phone 2689. If you could start with your name and you have three minutes. My name is Christina Robertson. Can you hear me? Yes. <clears throat> Most of us here have one thing in common. We would like to see our world experience healthy lives free from the confusion and suffering this past two years has brought to us, and we have different ideas on how to bring healing to our communities. Many too many people, many, have died over the past two years needlessly, and it is more important than ever to ask questions as to why. I don't believe COVID-19 is the culprit that brought all of this. Early intervention has been suppressed. Doctors with great success in treating people with inexpensive treatments have been suppressed and called quacks and lost their positions in many cases. People were told to go home and come back if they get worse, and I do believe in natural immunity, most definitely, especially for children. The media and some people here push fear and want the public to believe that if they get COVID, they will surely die or experience long-term negative health effects. If you take an objective look about this, you can see it is about money. Senator Elizabeth Warren has said the American people deserve to know the COVID-19 vaccine decisions are based on science and not on personal greed. 
billions are spent on pushing the, quote, safe and effective vaccine mantra worldwide. The largest advertiser on television are pharmaceutical companies, and the media pushes their concerns by suppressing the doctors and scientists are speaking out against the narrative with their facts, their ideas. There should be discussion here, not suppression, not censorship. They also assist in suppressing the early intervention treatments many doctors have had success with, great success, actually. The push for global vaccination goes against common sense and rational thinking and is clearly driven by a few powerful and greedy people position to profit greatly in terms of money and power. These people have lost many lawsuits, but they're protected from legal responsibility when it comes to vaccinations. If that vaccination can get on the childhood vaccine schedule. Now, no healthy child needs this non-vaccine, but that is the goal for this non-vaccine agenda. Right now, the so-called vaccine is protected from legal ramifications because it is in emergency use action status. Think about that and about the fact that all early interventions, as well as the doctors using them, have been suppressed. If there is an inexpensive, this is, this is key, if there is an inexpensive and effective treatment, the so-called vaccine cannot receive okay, you emergency use status. three minutes if status. you could wrap it up. And the fact that Think also about Pfizer doesn't want you to know the clinical trial results. And lastly, think about Maddie DeGray, an active, healthy 12-year-old, confined to life in a wheelchair from her vaccine treatment. And she is by far not the only vaccine-injured person not being talked about. And I thank you for listening. All right, thank you. And well, I am very sorry for anyone's loss. We'll go to Nikki Hind. If you could go ahead and start with your name, and you have three minutes. Okay, my name is Nikki Hind. I'm a Lake County resident and property taxpayer. First, I want to make clear that I fully endorse, both in content and urgency, all statements to the Board of Supervisors made by Dr. Will Tuttle. And I thank him for his initiative. After two years of nonsensical, contradictory guidelines, of logic-defying official explanations, of conflated statistics, distorted, cherry-picked data, and other chicanery, I am compelled to speak out too. It should not be necessary for citizens to have to provide the supervisors and health officers with essential information. But from the health officers' recent COVID report last week, there is an obvious lack of awareness, as well as an unfocused perspective. All COVID resolutions passed by the board and measures arising therefrom are presumptively authorized by the state of emergency issued by Gavin Newsom. But nobody seems to be asking the obvious question. Is there really cause for a medical emergency here in Lake County? In his report, the health officer expressed concerns around case numbers and ICU bed capacity. But if there was evidence to show that Lake County ICU beds have been strained beyond capacity, the health officer would presumably have included such data in his report. Instead, he presented ICU capacity data from London, England. This is absurd. There is no reasonable basis for comparing Lake County with London. London's 1,400 ICU beds support a population of 9 million people living within a density of 15,000 per square mile. Here in Lake County, we have eight ICU beds and a mere 51 people per square mile. Is the health officer going to compare Heathrow Airport with Lambton Field next? We call upon the Board of Supervisors to justify the continuation of any emergency measures with some real data based on some real science specific to Lake County, not statistically average case numbers from across the state presented in units of per 100K. We only have 63,000 in the county anyway. 
It's about time our Lake County officials paid attention to information outside the carefully curated, highly censored bubble known as mainstream media and beyond the corrupt global health authorities that seek to hype fear with their evidence-free variants of concern and can while their big three minutes business and wrap partners it up, please? make a killing on so-called vaccines, pun intended. Okay, thank you. We'll go to Julia Bono. You have three minutes if you could start with your name. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Chairperson. Um, my name is Julia Bono. I have a background in scientific research. Uh, first of all, I want to offer my most sincere condolences to those in our county, like Supervisor Crandell and his mother, who have been personally or indirectly adversely affected by the COVID-19 disease that I in no way wish to make light of. However, I do wish to point out the risks that the presently available COVID vaccines present to healthy individuals like the two people I know who have been substantially harmed by them and then offer some safe preventative and early treatment measures Lake County residents can take as an alternative. I also object to the highly questionable characterization of any of these vaccines as extremely safe and as effective as we have just heard from Dr. Evans since the CDC's own data shows otherwise. To minimize the risk of the COVID vaccines that essentially remain experimental since long-term and multi-generational double-blind studies studies with a control group have not yet been performed. I offer a summary of information from the CDC adverse event uh, report system or VAERS database. Um, as of uh, January 14th, 2022, we have over a million reports to this uh, regarding the uh, COVID vaccines. 22, includes 22,000 deaths, uh, over 118,000 hospitalizations, over 113,000 urgent care visits, uh, events, over 164,000 doctor office visits, over almost 9,000 anaphylaxis events, uh, and over 13,000 Bell's palsy. Um, uh, adverse events also include over 3,000 miscarriages, over 11,000 heart attacks, including someone I know, over 27,500 myocarditis, pericarditis events, over 39,000 people permanently disabled, over 5,000 thrombocytopenia low platelet events, over 25,000 life-threatening events, over 38,000 severe allergic reactions, and over almost 12,000 shingles events. Um, of the safer preventative alternatives to vaccination, uh, a sizable peer-reviewed study showed that those following highly acidifying, low-carbohydrate, high-protein diets were five and a half times more likely than those following alkalizing plant-based diets to suffer moderate to severe COVID symptoms that may result in hospitalization. The researchers concluded that a plant-based dietary pattern may therefore be considered for protection against moderate to severe COVID-19. Furthermore, numerous studies have shown the preventative nature of supplements like vitamin C, vitamin D, and zinc, especially in combination. Another natural treatment uses pineapple, which contains high concentrations of bromelain and vitamin C that have been shown to result in both a faster decrease in mucus and a speedier recovery time in respiratory infections. In fact, one study showed using pineapple extract helped people recover from their respiratory conditions 4.8 times faster. In addition, the relatively natural and non-toxic antiviral known as colloidal silver has been demonstrated effective against both preventing and treating coronaviruses and is a potent inhibitor of SARS-CoV-2. A simple and inexpensive treatment protocol protocol for coronaviruses that cause the common cold is to spray the nose and throat with colloidal silver. For lower respiratory infections, a patient can inhale a fine mist of nanocolloidal silver using an inhaler or nebulizer. Okay, you've while for three minutes, well, if you could wrap it up, please. While prevention might be seen by ingesting lower colloidal silver doses of 10 and 30 parts per million, stronger colloidal silver concentrations in the 500 parts per million range might be required to treat more serious cases. If you oppose medical mandates in Lake County, please visit the website www.standuplakecounty.org and sign and share the link petition. I also invite our supervisors okay, to do the same. We're going to go on to Elaine Zacker. You have three minutes. If you could start with your name. This is Elaine Zacker. Can you hear me? Yes. If you could speak a little louder. Okay. There you go. Uh, I have a question for Dr. Evans. Um, are Lake County urgent care facilities and hospitals using low-cost proven treatments like vitamin D, ivermectin, budesonide, and others that have been shown in, peer re in published peer-reviewed studies and meta-studies to be effective treatments for COVID-19 if used early. Um, and the studies show 
The studies show that if given early at appropriate doses, they are effective treatments. So thank you. Okay, thank you. Dr. Evans, if you wanted to answer that question. So, so the studies in ivermectin were flawed and fraudulent. Um, there's no evidence that ivermectin is actually helpful in the treatment of, of COVID-19 disease. What happens frequently with patients that use this is they overuse it and it has neurotoxicity and people have been hospitalized with ivermectin poisoning as a result of it. So I don't recommend ivermectin. Ivermectin is, is used a lot in the third world for river blindness and we have a lot of experience with it taken in the doses that are typically prescribed. It is a safe medication. Um, but it has not been shown to prevent or cure uh, COVID-19. Vitamin D, vitamin C, and zinc uh, have shown some promise not to cure, but uh, just to prevent or to help in the treatment. And I think the plant-based diets are also a great idea. Um, so I hope that answers your question. Thank you. We'll go to phone 1113. If you could start with your name and you have three minutes. Uh, yes, hi, uh, this is Dr. Will Tuttle. And uh, yeah, it's very frustrating to uh, hear these things being said by the health director, Dr. Charlie Evans, because, uh, and nothing personal, but I think it's well understood that if he said anything else, he would lose his job because the, uh, you know, the whole, this whole thing is controlled from a higher level. Um, it's well understood that uh, ivermectin, for example, is being used very, very successfully all over the world and that many countries like India, the, the state in India, Uttar Pradesh, with almost 300 million people, and they have basically no COVID at all, no problems, because they use, everybody uses ivermectin. And there's, uh, same thing has been true for hydroxychloroquine. There's been many protocols that have been created. The Zelenko protocol, for example, where you had virtually 100% success uh, using hydroxychloroquine and uh, zinc and azithromycin and so forth. So there's been many protocols that have been deliberately suppressed by the NIH. So basically, what we have to understand here is that the COVID deaths are basically either murders or hoaxes. They're murders because there are many well-known and inexpensive treatments, like we've been talking about, which have been deliberately suppressed by the corrupt FDA and the CDC and the NIH. And uh, many countries are using them. And they're also, if they're not that, they're hoaxes because, again, the corrupt WHO has deliberately approved the PCR test, which is absurd to say that that is a gold standard it's it's been now it's been dropped by the cdc because it's uh it's not a, it's, it's it's wrong i mean it's there's it generates massive numbers of false positives which were used to create all the hysteria of this whole covid thing and so um the C, the uh even if people died from other things when they were uh, when people came into the hospital from pneumonia or a car accident or a heart attack the CDC mandated that if they tested positive for COVID along the way, which they had to do, they would be listed as a COVID death. And hospitals, of course, have been given large uh, financial incentives to test for COVID and to use ineffective and toxic uh, and, frankly, deadly treatments like remdesivir and ventilators, which studies have shown have killed many people that otherwise would not have died. Uh, it's also it keeps failing to be recognized that asymptomatic people do not spread disease. This is a fundamental, we've known this for hundreds of years. Asymptomatic people do not spread disease. We're healthy. The whole rationale for testing, for distancing, for lockdown, for masking is based on this deception. Uh, it's also well known that natural immunity is far superior to vaccine-related immunity, which is now seen to be completely non-existent. The other thing we have to keep in mind is that, uh, as journalist C.J. Hopkins has written in a recent article, these are the last days of a COVIDian cult. The whole corrupt and deceptive COVID narrative is collapsing everywhere. It should be obvious okay, you've now. Reached your three as minutes, you no doubt you are aware, England, England has now completely put an end to the whole charade, and there's no more masks or, or anything in England. Okay, and this, so we're going to go ahead and go here. to phone. Wait, I... I, oh, I go ahead, Supervisor Price. Yeah, I just want to... 
uh, clarify that um, Dr. Evans is not our public health director. Our new public health director is Director Portney, Jonathan Portney, who's just joined us. Dr. Evans is an ER physician who has been treating COVID over the past two years and has that direct experience, which a lot of our callers do not. So I, I just want to point that out. And also that Dr. Evans has encouraged people to communicate with their physicians for um, for medical advice. And I, and I would just hope that no one is getting medical advice on this call today, on this through this meeting. Thank you. We'll go to four, uh, phone 4627. If you could start with your name and you have three minutes. Good morning. Uh, this is Tom Slate. Jessica, haven't you been advising people to get vaccinated? Is that not medical information? Um, I don't even know what to say to that, but I had a few thoughts. And Eddie, I'm so sorry, and sincerely, I think any of us would be to hear about your mom. It's your personal business, but you did make it public. And I would like to speak to that. Um, it even makes me feel bad, you know, and uh, about that. But listen to some of what we are saying. Look into this. Apparently, early treatments do it. But check these out for yourself, and you decide, because I think at the very least it will raise questions in your mind. And like Dr. Tell or Will, we all call him Will, um, said about the PCR test has been, in a word, but reasonable to say discredited. So, so much of what we say, and maybe all of it, is correct or good information for you to check out, Eddie. And please do that. Just, we don't make this stuff up. So, uh, I'm just very disappointed. To me, the elephant in the room for today is that these tre there are these treatments and there's much credible research to show that they do work. So thank you all. Okay, well, just one more point of clarity. I, you know, I'm talking about access and equity for those who want the vaccine. That's what I said today. And that's why we want to make this van available so that people have the option. Okay, we'll go to Nara. Is it Nara? Nara? Just, just real quick. Um, okay. Yeah, I, I did. I did make it public, and I, in, like I was told before uh, by one of my constituents, I ran for this position, and I understand that at times when things get brought up, that's what the job inquires, and that's why I brought it up because it is important um, um, for people to know that this is empirical, and this is this is life situations right now. It's unfortunate that it's, it's in my life right now, but I know there's others that have dealt with it, you know, um, and, uh, you know, um, believe me, I'll give anything to have my mom awake right now and, and whatnot. And I have read the book that you've given us, but either way, it neither, neither weighs the fact that the IC rooms are filled and all of that other, you know, and, and things that other doctors are telling us are true too. So why can't we just meet in the middle and figure it out instead of being divisive about it. That's my point. Thank you, Chair what, Um What was that? We just had a strange photo. Matthew, did you catch that? Uh, Nara, you have three minutes. If you could start with your name. Sure. Hi, Nara Dalbaka. I'm a resident okay. of District hang on, 1. Hang on just a second. I don't know what that picture is, but I, I like to take that picture down while she makes her comment. Matthew, are you able to do that? I think so. So that's a photograph associated with uh, the user's Zoom profile. I don't have. Yeah, the sorry. That's that. That might just be my 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 headshot is a is a cat. <laughs> is that <laughs> uh, Matthew? Can you do something with that or no? As long as uh, Ms. Dalbaka has the um, ability to talk, the <laughs> profile picture will be showing unless she removes it. It's a bizarre photo. It's Let's go ahead and do three minutes. Right. You can start with your name. Thanks. Hi. Yeah, Nara Dalbaka, District 1 resident. Um, I'm, I'm calling in because um, I'm actually going to ask the Board of Supervisors if there's anything that you all can do to make the uh, have the unified school district meetings be available by Zoom because um, I've tried. Uh, I wanted to attend several of the, the MUSD meetings when they were discuss discussing COVID protocols and uh, the mask mandates were not being enforced there. there were, the uh, members of the school board were visibly scared and threatened by the people that were in attendance um, and were not getting an accurate uh, view of, of the beliefs of the people who 
who were not able to attend because um, I have an unvaccinated three-year-old child. I'm not going to, um, and, a, and a dad who's immune compromised, I'm not going to go attend a meeting in person and risk my family. Um, but all I was able to do was send it an email that I don't think was looked at until after the meeting. So those of us who are actually concerned about this virus and who do listen to science are, are being blocked from public meetings where they're making decisions about our children and our, um, and our schools. And um, I moved to the Middletown School District to send my child to this school, and now I'm, I'm deeply concerned about the leadership. So um, I don't, this, the fact that this meeting is available by Zoom makes it so that my, my voice and my, um, and my vote can be heard and counted um, and that's not being allowed right now at the, at the school board meetings because there, aren't, there is no Zoom access and the people that attend the meetings are often threatening, are not wearing masks, are yelling at people um, who choose to wear masks at the meeting. And, um, and it's not a safe environment for, for uh, those of us who, uh, who are following the science and who are concerned about our family members uh, to be able to comment. So I'm, I'm here on another item today, but... Um, I just, I just uh, hope that you all know that that's what's happening at the school board meetings. Thanks. I appreciate that, and um, I agree that these meetings should be available by Zoom, but each school district has their own board and their own superintendent, and we do not have jurisdiction um, over um, the school districts. Supervisor Spatier? There's other ways to communicate your public input. You can always email it to the board members. You could always ask the board members to get stuff moving onto Zoom. Um, I think there's de definitely other ways to make sure that you are heard. And as uh, elected officials, we should do everything to be able to read what is submitted to us so that we do hear at least the voices that aren't able to come to the public meetings. Supervisor Paiska. And um, I share your concern, Nara. I... Um I do know that Middletown hired a new IT director and they did broadcast the meeting on Facebook Live. It's unfortunate because you can't participate remotely, but that is um, something that you could pursue with the district um, because I, I agree, it's important to have that access. Okay. I'm going to go to the next caller, Jason Miller. If you could start with your name, you have three minutes. Yeah, can you can you hear me? My name's actually I have a, somebody else's phone, so it came up their name. My name's Jeremy Rarick. Um, first, I want to start by talking about what Nara just said. Uh, she is a political operative. Um, she said that it's white supremacy is why uh, she wasn't able can, to. Can, we could stick. Yes, we we could stick to the topic at hand right now. It's and talk to us, not about other public members, yeah. please. Okay, well, let's, let's talk to you. Let's talk about, since we're talking about personal experiences. My personal experience is I went to the hospital on November 28th, chest pains, um, couldn't breathe, and all they cared about was, was I vaccinated or not? Um, after four hours of being there, and they said, are you scared of microchips and ridiculing me, they sent me home with a pulmonary embolism and almost killed me. Um, it wasn't noticed till a cardiologist relooked at my scans days later. And that's what this is doing. This is affecting people by this paranoia. This, if you get a political doctor, you're not going to get the same amount of care. And I believe Dr. Evans has shown himself as to be a very political doctor. And just like Gary Pace, I mean, it's been unbelievable over the last few years. Since then, I've gotten Omicron since then, or COVID, and it was literally the sniffles for a couple days. You know, and I'm still with some massive health issues. Um, so, you know, I, I think what we, what we are gonna continue to do, I mean, when the, next, when the next variant comes out, are we all gonna freak out again? Are we gonna shut stuff down? Are we gonna, uh, you know, test everybody? You know, when I got COVID a couple weeks ago, we had to test all my kids. None of them had any symptoms whatsoever, but they tested positive. They, not a symptom in the world. Hmm. You know, and for me, it was just a runny nose and a headache for a couple of days. So, uh, you know, for, for every person that's in the hospital, there's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands that it's a runny nose. And, and that's very similar to the flu or the cold. You know, if you look at the new numbers, it, the, the mortality rate is very similar. If not, I mean, if you're running 
you're 45 years old, you're the mortality. You have a better chance of dying from the flu than you do COVID. And you know that's straight from the CDC. You know, and, and now they're saying that the the 75 percent of the deaths had four or more comorbidities. That's again straight from the CDC. And just one more thing: just yesterday, uh, doctors met in Washington D.C. that aren't allowed to speak. There's a five and a half hour seminar where doctors from all over the country that are top in their fields said exactly the opposite. Okay, three Dr. minutes are up. If you could wrap it up, please. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, it, it needs to stop. I mean, obviously, this is going to be a fun political season. Okay. Thank you. Okay, seeing no new hands in the Zoom room, we're going to go ahead and go to the boardroom. Is there anybody in the boardroom wishing to speak on this topic? Go ahead and come up to the mic. If you could state your name, you have three minutes. Hi, my name is Helena Brook, and it will be very short. Um, I rather resent the fact that unvaccinated people are getting priority over vaccinated people in the hospitals. That may be cruel, but that's not what I feel. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Seeing no public comment, we'll close public comment. Um, Dr. Evans or Director Portney, is there anything else you would like to add today before we move on to our next item? I just wanted to say that we've, we've crossed uh, 850,000 deaths from COVID-19 in this country. You know, we've, we've never had a pandemic in our lifetime that's had anything close to this. You know, this, although many people that get sick with COVID, uh, it's a common cold for many, uh, it's a death sentence. And we need to take this very seriously and we need to work together to get our way out of this. And that's gonna be a, a step-by-step -step process, inch by inch, and I appreciate all the people who are working so hard to get us there. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Evans. And then I saw Chair Crandall, you had your hand up. Yes, I just wanted to um, state that I, um, you know, I, I empathize with a portion of what Mr. Rarick had stated. Being in the hospital is difficult, especially by yourself. Um, I know pre-COVID being in hospitals with my mother, since we've talked about personal experiences, I was able to be there with her and talk about her medications and whatnot. She wasn't able to have that now. And so I do understand and agree that there's a lot of other things that are affecting us on both sides of this. And um, it, either way, this is, this is affecting our people. And um, people that are being careless about it is also reasons why people getting, are getting sick. And so I, I just, I, I apologize for bringing this personal experience out. I just want everyone to know it's real and there's nothing more than I would love to see everyone, us all get past this. You know, I thought we were past it as well. Um, but of course it's, it's something we're, we're, we're going to have to work with. And I do understand people are, um, getting different symptoms. My granddaughter caught it. Um, she's one years old and she successfully came out of it. My daughter caught it. She's okay. But unfortunately, my mother caught it and she is an elder. And so, you know, there's nothing I wouldn't give to have another, uh, my, my grandfather passed at 80. I'd, I'd love to have another week with him just to learn some of the language that he knew that I didn't get to learn all of. I'm sure there's other people here listening, tuning in that want to at least have their elders or people that have knowledge. Just think about the retiree that was uh, Gordon. I mean, he's an el he was an elder, but he knew so much and any type of knowledge we can get from that man is important. Now, we don't want to you know, make people like, you know, in, in their senior citizen ages susceptible to this or people that even have comorbidities. None of that. So I just, you know, I just highlight that and, and I'm not trying to for or against anything. I just want people to understand. Let's just take it seriously. This is a real thing, regardless of what the news or anybody's saying. Let's look at what's happening in Lake County. Thank you. And if there's nothing further from the supervisors, we'll go ahead and close this item and move on to the next one.